Um, you're right. The thumbnail is a clickbait. I actually have some of it. It's not a clickbait. Um, the thumbnail is a gray pea concoction that my friend Giannis, who's Latvian, made um, for our little get together yesterday. It's like a traditional kind of Christmas time to New Year's dish um, that he grew up eating, so he made it for us. I have a little tub of it, and I'm thinking I will actually combine my little tub of gray peas and the kale that we're about to cook today and make some sort of like delicious um, kale, pea, onion, sausage concoction. My home is really drafty right now. I don't know if anyone else's insulation is lacking, but my insulation is very lacking. Um, but welcome to Monday. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas. I'm gonna go put on a sweater because <laughs> it's cold in here. I'm, um, oh, yes, tropical country sounds great. I'm really tired all of a sudden. I think I had a okay morning where I woke up and I was like, this is gonna be great. I feel energetic. And then just about half an hour ago, um, I was like, oh, I guess I don't feel good today. <laughs> um, but we are still going to cook. And hi, Texas. And hi everyone. Um, I have some kale soaking. We will strip it. I will be cooking the stems as well, but maybe separately from the leaves. I don't have a plan yet, but that's what we're here to do. I'm also going to heat up some water so we can make some tea for ourselves. keep scraping my tattoo on things. I'm very worried it's not gonna heal very well. But we shall see. No use worrying about life. How is the connection? It's probably not as great as yesterday's, but hopefully it's good. Um, do I have a weatherization program? Probably, maybe. Am I going to look into it? Probably not. Why? I'm lazy and tired and I'll just deal with it for now. Um, but. I also don't know what installing new windows would mean because that seems like a lot of supply chain. Um, I'm, just, I'm just tired and lazy, y'all. That's just how my life is going to be like for now. So we shall just strip the kale. Which is very exciting, I know.
the kale, I will proceed to wash the leaves again because they can be quite gritty and um, they, kale is one of those things where depending on how it was cleaned before it got to you, it's probably better to be safe than sorry. Can often trap a lot of crunchies in a not good crunchy way. a lot of stems and I'm thinking the stems will be perfect to go with the peas since I don't have a lot of peas either and, and Yana Soso said that the peas were slightly undercooked so I think they'll go perfectly together getting cooked together um, and then for the leaves I'm going to see what I can do because I kind of want to make a chickpea onion tomato sauce situation but I don't really have chickpeas. I have these like what they call split chick chickpeas um, but I don't really know if these are chickpeas. They they look more like yellow peas to me. I got these from Patel's and they, they said it's split chickpeas on the packaging but it's not really looking like chickpeas to me. It's way more yellow and the shape is different. You know, peas be peas, and I think they can go in the instant pot. Um, so, <sighs> am I missing anything in chat? I think y'all are just talking to yourself, huh? Yay! Love it. It's it's gonna be a chill time tonight, or this afternoon. Whatever. Since I know I will be doing these peas, I'm going to go ahead and rinse and soak. Probably don't need to worry too much about soaking them for too long since they'll, they'll be cooked in the Instant Pot anyway, but a rinse is always a good idea.
I also don't know why it is, but I've been craving pasta recently. Has, has anyone else been craving pasta? Is this like a mercury and retrograde thing where we all just crave pasta? Or maybe it's just a winter depression thing where we're just like carbs. Yes. I have this crushed tomatoes that I think we can use today. And let's think about the other things. One thing at a time. Here are my friend Giannis's gray peas. Oh no, pie with no sugar. I mean, that doesn't sound terrible. Maybe you could drizzle some condensed milk on top, sweetened condensed milk. the kale since it's not cooked and all the peas are cooked is I'm just going to cook them in a little bit of water and try to get them boiling um, but instead of just using water I made this anchovy mushroom stock um, which will be featured in the H Mart video whenever that gets edited and I think we can use that to amp up the flavors a little bit since I already have it. This is my anchovy mushroom broth. Stems can be a little woodsy and tough, so I'm just giving them a little head start. Yana um, seasoned these pretty well already, so I'm not too worried about adding too many more flavors in, but I might go in with a little more salt and pepper. Um, says kale stems are not edible. Jesus Christ. They're just tough. Everyone who says that they're not edible are just being big babies. You can cook them. Okay, salt, white pepper, black pepper.
have an opinion on why I don't prefer pineapple on pizza, although I don't think it's like such a sacrilegious thing to have pineapple on pizza. I just personally don't like it. And I think it's because when I eat pizza, I prefer pizza that has tomato sauce that's already a little bit sweetened um, to the point where you can not really taste the, the sugar in it, but you can taste like the brightness of the tomato, then it brings out the natural sweetness of the tomato. And I feel like when I have a sauce that is already really balanced on that sweet tartness scale, tipping huge chunks of pineapple onto that slice just brings out too much sugar. Um, and it makes the, it makes my brain feel like I'm not eating savory anymore. Um, and that's, that's mo that's why I don't prefer pineapple. But if you want pineapple on your pizza, who am I to deny you those pleasures? You know? <sighs> now I'm gonna wash my kale leaves really well and we will start putting them into the Instant Pot with some of my cooked onions that we roasted in the oven on the last live, like over a week ago. They're still holding up. They're doing pretty well. Um, and I think it's because I oiled them and I salted them enough so that they're almost like preserved. They're like a comfy onion. Um, they have been so delicious. They are gonna be featured prominently in the H Mart video because I just put them on all the leftovers and they make everything taste better. Um, so oven roasted onions. washing this kale, I'm basically starting to rip it a little bit with my hands. Um, I don't find chopping kale to be a pleasant experience, mostly because it's so voluminous, it kind of just goes all over, and especially if you don't have a massive cutting board, it just doesn't really work out. So I think hand torn kale is the easiest way. You can do it in a big bowl and it contains all the mess, and you don't have to worry about losing your fingers in the leaves. It also makes the leaves smaller and more manageable, which means you can tossle them around a little bit more as they're being rinsed, so that you know they don't um, trap more dirt than if they were to stay in the big leaves. This is up to a boil. Now I'm going to ponder what to do for our instant pot. Over here. So I definitely want tomato. I don't think I'm going to be using this whole jar, so let's find the jar to put our leftovers into. Apparently 
apparently there's 13 servings per container in here. out this can with some more of our anchovy broth that way we get all of that flavor in there I'm going to need a little more water and broth. Mainly because we have so many peas. These are our peas. I'm going to pour them into the instant pot. Earlier this morning, I boiled some um, peanuts for Grandma, and I used some of Mom's cinnamon sticks. And I think they still have a little bit of flavor, so I'm going to pop these in there as well. Next, we're going to add our onion caramelized onions. These above caramelized onions, is that what I said? These smell amazing. So good. Stir that around a little bit. I think we need one more spoon. Okay. What else we got in here? Okay, two. Spicy kick to it. I'm gonna add some of this um, Thai non-prick pow. It's 
chili paste and soybean oil so this will also give us a little bit more fat as well in there in addition to the spice Nice little sugar, umami, tamarind, chili, shallot, garlic, shrimp. It's good stuff. I got this jar for a dollar because it was like expired um, with no date. I don't even know when it expired. I just know that they were trying to get rid of it. So I got it for a dollar. It's worked out pretty well for me. I'm going to stir that around a little bit to get it all dissolved. Then we can pop in our kale. And this is how washed my kale is now. I'm gonna show you the color of this rinse water. You ready? That's green. That's how much I wash my kale. I start wrecking it. Um, our kale stems are dry now, which means they are nicely cooked. I'm going to pour in a little bit of our tea water to rehydrate them a little bit more. And then we can add in Giannis's gray peas and sausage and onions, all that good stuff. No, they're just gray peas. They're, they're peas that are born gray. I don't know who to ask why they're gray. Okay, so we got all the flavor on the bottom with the tomato and the trip shrimp chili paste and the caramelized onions and um, we need some flavoring on top just because I don't want the kale to be completely so isolated. So we're going to go in with some of our algae salt. Don't worry, 
I will stir that around a little bit. We're gonna do a little bit of pepper. to go in with a little bit of fennel seed. Um, just like that. And we'll stir it. It already smells so good, and it's not even cooked. Um, and I think for extra lusciousness, I'm going to drizzle in a little bit of olive oil. Just We need some fat in our lives, you know? It's the winter. never see this again for the rest of this live because that's going to take like an hour. Now we can make grandma's yotel dough, which I do so many times now. It's hardly news to you all. We should probably also put her some tea. I feel like a little matcha could be nice. really hungry. I want to see that these stems are mushable by my spoon because if they're not mushable they're probably going to be a little too chewy. To add 
some heft into this meal. I think I'm going to chop up a couple of these rehydrated shiitake mushrooms and plop them in there. It's not a lot of meat in that concoction so far. So mushrooms could be a nice way to plump it up a little bit in terms of substance. the Latvian tradition for these peas is that you make like a pretty big batch of it around Christmas and you should finish it by the time New Year's hits and it's hilarious because Giannis was describing it to me as like almost like a self-flagellation sort of thing because it's just every year you eat the same thing and you make a huge batch of it and it's like there's a dictation of basically you have to finish it, it almost feels like a punishment of sorts but to me, they are quite delicious. I would not mind eating this every day. Um, I loved, I loved eating them. I'm gonna pop a little of these anchovies in there too. They're like Korean anchovies. I just want to ask a TMI question for all of my viewers who go through menstrual cycles. Did having COVID fuck up your cycle? Because I feel like COVID really fucked up my cycle and I feel like that's leading to a lot of hormone changes and fluctuations and maybe that's why I'm so tired constantly. Um, I feel like this is not an isolated exception. I feel like it, there has to be a pattern because I, I think I remember when I first got vaccinated, that also really mess, messed with my period. Um, so not sure what the correlation is, but it seems like COVID is just really, it just really gets into your system. Um, Is there a difference between cooking the vegetables in the hot pot first or letting them cook in the chicken broth? I think it's a personal preference. I don't, you've seen the way I cook. I hardly care about the order of sequence.
Right. Yo tail dub. I did a smart thing this time and <coughs> instead of asking one of you to Google the recipe for me, I I Googled it beforehand and I wrote it down on a piece of paper. Um So the recipe is going to be two and a quarter cups of all-purpose flour, which is around 290 grams of all-purpose flour, plus two tablespoons cornstarch, and we're going to go in with baking powder, baking soda, we're going to go in with salt, we're going to go in with sugar, and water. Oil is optional. Oh my god, I just poured sugar all over my counter and floor. I'll be okay. Yo, these energy dips are crazy. They set in so fast and they enervate you so completely. Or at least for me, they do. I don't know what the hell is going on anymore. So for the H Mart haul video, I bought a cacao fruit, like, I bought a whole cacao fruit, this is the rind of it, and inside are pods, and each pod has a little bit of fruit, and inside the little tiny bit of fibrous fruit, you have the cacao nib, which is then usually fermented and turned into chocolate through roasting and combination with dairy fats, um, sugar, all of that. I didn't know I could buy this either, but I found it at H Mart. So I said, you know what? We're making a video for the sake of science and the internet, I'm gonna buy one. It was not cheap, but I bought it because um, hopefully this video makes some money. Um, and if it doesn't, then fuck it. I tried cacao fruit. But anyway, it is very bitter for the most part. And so what I decided to do was um, candy it. So I candied it with a lot of sugar. It's You can see it's solidified, right? The syrup has become very thick. And basically the fruit has turned into like a jelly substance around the cacao nib. And I eat a couple of these and it literally feels like um, a very strong cup of coffee. So I think this will be a good time for me to have a little sugar hit and a little caffeine hit. So let me just show you guys what it looks like on the inside. That's pretty cool. It doesn't taste like chocolate chocolate, but It tastes a little bit like a wet forest and coffee that's been sitting just long enough that it's not quite cold yet, but it's just past lukewarm. And it tastes a little bit like when you eat um, a piece of rice that got too toasty that it burnt. 
and you can see the outside is I use like a cup of sugar to candy this so it is very sweet and jelly like on the outside the H Mart haul video when I edit it will be on this channel this channel will contain all of my random videos. I don't know when it'll be, but I predicted yesterday that before the end of January it should be out. So, stay tuned. And it could be placebo. Or it could just be the fact that I ate like three tablespoons of sugar on top of the cacao nibs. But I do feel like a little bit of a hot air being blown into me right now. is mostly dry I'm going to go ahead and taste it see where we're at you know what the worst part about the retaliation is that obviously they can't say it's retaliation so they put on so many mental games to discredit you as a human being and make you feel like you did all of these wrong things. And the worst part is making you question your own constitution. Um, it made me feel like I was such a terrible person. And I think for the two weeks after um, my non-disciplinary meetings, I was like in a zombie state where I just didn't even know what to think about myself anymore. I started asking all my friends like, hey, do you think I'm really rude? Um, am I too rude? Like, have I been mean unnecessarily? As as like a, I just started like asking all these questions and I, I just didn't know who to believe anymore and I didn't believe in myself anymore. Um, and then the disciplinary meeting came and they were like, here's everything that you did wrong and it's against our code of conduct and this will be your final warning and I was like hmm and it was actually that disciplinary meeting that made me realize that like wow something's really wrong here because they promised to provide me after the first two non-disciplinary meetings with communication coaching because they said your tone is contributing to a toxic workplace and you you should think about getting communication coaching and we can help you with that. And I was like, fine, I'll do, I'll, I'll take the communication coaching. I hope you can give it to the rest of the team too, to whoever wants to participate because I don't think it's a me thing. I think communication takes two parties and you know, whoever wants to participate in them should. HR never gave me that communication training. Um, basically two months passed between the non-disciplinary meetings and me being fired and in those two months, no discipline, like no, no coaching that was promised. Um, they did not help me at all. They basically just made me spill everything, um, the good and the bad. And then they used it as fuel for their case against me. Um, and in the meantime, not knowing what their game plan was, I was acting under the impression of them doing this in good faith, which stupid me, right? Like, why would you ever trust HR to do anything? Um, but now I know better. Um, I don't regret any of the actions that I took and I am thankful to have seen it from the inside out, what this was all about and how these things work. It's been eye-opening. It's been a learning experience. I can say now firsthand what corporate HR does and how they do it. And I know what to look out for. And I know to 
not ever let somebody else make me feel like I don't trust myself because when they take your confidence and yourself away, they take away all of you. Um, they hollow you out from the inside and So when I was given a severance offer of less than 10k, I thought immediately to the fact that just being put through those HR meetings was well worth more than 10k in psychological damages, honestly. And to have accepted that amount under those conditions and circumstances would have just been like letting them kick me around for one more time um, and I couldn't I couldn't see the point in doing that to myself um, I am very disappointed that um, this is what happened after being at a company for four and a half years like It was a good chunk of my, it was a good chunk of my 20s to 30s arc. Like I passed my, my 30s at this job. And um, so, yes, it sucks. Yes, I'm very sad, but also I'm incredibly thankful. Um, New York State is at will. The entire state is at will. Um, and this is why they can say whatever to fire me. Um, technically, they aren't breaking any laws by just firing me, but we can make a very convincing case that given surrounding events that I've not disclosed um, in that article, that these reasons could very well be pretexts for retaliation firing. Um, but I'm also grateful for my time at Delish. Um, I'm grateful that I was given an opportunity to do what I did for a job and to explore my skills and develop them. And, you know, like I said, it's been a great time, but it's extremely disappointing to see that it had to end this way. Um, didn't have to end this way. They could have been more communicative with me by saying point blank, hey, don't do this, otherwise we will fire you. But they didn't. Hi, Naz. Nice to see you, friend. Um, if they had given me very clear directives of how to behave, I would have considered following them. But because there's this game of total opacity and total... Um, shifting the narrative that I'm actually the one to blame and that I'm just the problem, I think that made me so uncertain of what steps to take next. When you don't have honesty, you can't draw a blueprint that is understandable to both parties, especially to someone who's not familiar with the corporate lingo of, of euphemisms. Um, when they say that I use vulgar language by saying the word shit. Do they then also apply the same rule of no vulgarity allowed in the workplace to other people who routinely say fucking shit as colloquialisms in meetings? Because we're all adults here. We're not in the eighth grade anymore. We can say fucking shit. We do. Workplaces say, oh my gosh, that was a fucking day. Or, man, this shit is a lot to handle. Like, at what point do you choose to enforce what counts as vulgarity and what counts as just expression? Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of knots. K-N-O-T-S. There, was, there were a lot of knots for me to untangle from the fallout of that. I got a very persistent question. 
on my YouTube, on my Instagram, in my DMs, why did you wait this long to tell us? Because I was telling the NLRB the story, I was telling Stephen the journalist the story, I was telling my friends the story, I was telling myself the story to try to sort it out and make sense of it all. It's like a fucking jigsaw puzzle that I had to piece together and be like, okay, what just happened? Um, to be let go so suddenly um, took a while for me to process. And like I said to you several times on these lives, I wasn't ready to disclose everything because I wasn't ready um, to share all the details yet because I wasn't sure yet what was happening inside and out. So that's why it took so long for me to talk about it openly with everyone. And sometimes you just don't have a timeline for when you feel comfortable. That fishy flavor is adding so much umami to the sausage and the mushrooms. Quite delightful. I'm gonna read some of your comments now. I was told also by my managers that HR is there to help, that HR has been very good at helping them problem solve in the past. So I was given the messaging that HR is very much there to problem solve. If I don't operate under a system of trusting who I work for, then there is no reason why I should stay in an environment where I can't operate on trust. I chose to operate on trust because to exist otherwise is unbearable for me. Um, I don't want to develop relationships with people that I can't trust. So I chose to trust. And I trusted the words that HR was there to help. So I trusted HR. And what happened following trusting HR is what you read. Um, I wanted to believe that I worked at a place that could hold honest conversations and I found out that my honesty was intolerable to those who um, had the power to hire and fire. So now I know. Now I know that I can't work in environments where there is a fear around transparency. I simply cannot exist in spaces where honesty is considered a fault and an attack. I am honest to work together towards a solution. I am honest to have conversations. I don't expect the other person to just be like, yeah, June, you're totally right. Let's fix everything your way. No, I'm honest because I want to propose my perspective and I want to engage in conversation to see what we can do together as a team rather than individuals to work collaboratively towards um, finding a solution that works best for everyone. And if there's disagreement, then I want to work in a place where you can allow disagreements to happen without this kind of hidden game of punishment bingo. I felt like I was inadvertently placed into a, a bingo game where they were ticking off all these boxes of like things that I shouldn't have done but weren't made known to me until too late. Um, so
I loved the fact that they found me so scary to them that they fired me. It means that I held power that they were not ready to um, confront. So being fired in and of itself is showing me my value in a sort of way um, that has become very affirming. I am proud of myself and I will deal with the consequences of speaking out. I will continue to deal with any consequences that might continue to fall out because I have chosen to do what feels right and this felt right. And hopefully this can encourage and embolden other people to also speak out about the ways in which they've been bullied. And I don't really care to stay in corporate media, so if I burn the bridges and I can't do corporate media, that's fine by me too, because this this world has already shown to me what it's made of, and I don't want any more of it inside me. Um, it's not good to consume any more of that. Yeah. Okay, so Chandla Kella says a lot of DEI work in corporations is all about checking boxes. The bigger the org, the less they care about their employees. It's all about money. We have had so many DEI workshops that we could sign up for. I went to a couple of them. They're not very useful for me. It's all held for people to be like self-policing themselves, to be more aware of what they can do as employees and as managers to be more aware of everyone's differences and backgrounds and how to be respectful and how to come at it with different interpretations and angles and you know rainbows and butterflies but like what the fuck is the company doing to also hold themselves to that standard they hide behind niceties they hide behind decorum. They hide behind distance. They hide behind opacity. They're not being truthful because they can't. Once they become truthful, they have to reveal what their bottom line is. And the bottom, the bottom line is never about respecting people, right? In a corporation, we know what the bottom line is. I think, um, I think YouTube wasn't lucrative enough for them, and so even though I was getting the views, um, that didn't mean expansion for the brand, and so to further expand the brand, um, the next step was the TV show, and when I turned down the TV show, it became clear that I was no longer of any use. Um, in terms of expanding the brand. Combined with my outspokenness, both in terms of management's inadequacies and in terms of the way that Hearst was union busting and spending how, who knows how many millions on those lawyers for the last three years instead of giving us pay raises and gender neutral bathrooms and all that we've been asking for. Um, that it just became a cost and benefit analysis for them and it seemed to cost them more than they were willing so I got terminated it makes sense in my head now I mean it's all clear obviously but I 
At the end of the day, in capitalism, we are all replaceable. The only way that we make ourselves irreplaceable is by not making ourselves fit in. For our entire lives, we've been told that we have to do things a certain way in order to succeed. They made us shave ourselves down to fit in. Because we were told that the only way to survive is to fit in. And I just got too tired of shaving myself down, I guess. It no longer became worth it for me. And after mom died, I didn't... I wanted to allow myself to fully be myself because several people told me that I am my mom's biggest legacy, which means that if I shave myself down, I'm also shaving mom down. And there's no amount of money that can replace holding on to what I have left of mom. So, learning how to value myself even when society doesn't value it has been amazing. It's been freeing. It's been so soothing. I feel so much more at peace now. Um, my future is uncertain. My financials are uncertain, but I feel like I've afforded myself so much peace. Um, so I guess when they say money can't buy happiness, I mean, yes, money can buy happiness, but there's also a certain kind of happiness that money is actually detrimental for. Um, because when you chase after the money, they make you sell yourself off in exchange. So it's all a balancing act in the end for, for each and every one of us to decide how much of ourselves we're willing to let go of, how much um, identity preservation is worth it in exchange for sustenance preservation. Um, so I love kale stems. Your girl can eat kale stems all day long. That won't be a problem. I still didn't make the yotel go. What the hell? <laughs> I'm making this dough for Lala for like a week now. I feel so bad. But I forgot, I forgot how much filming a video takes out of you. Especially filming food. You do it all day long for days on end. And then you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. So, but we're doing it now. I still have to be a granddaughter. And grandma still needs her fried dough. So, 290 grams of all-purpose flour. tablespoons of cornstarch plus one and a quarter teaspoons of baking powder. I guess I should measure this with an actual teaspoon. Salt kosher, 
for the grains. And a tablespoon of sugar. And this isn't in my delish recipe, but I decided that a little bit of yeast is really good. Makes it really puffy. We're gonna go ahead and do that. I did like a half teaspoon there. Um, a lot of you are like probably um, sad that Delish owns so much of my recipes and stuff, but, and I was too, but you know what I realized is you just make new recipes. <laughs> The world of creativity can be endless as long as you don't box yourself into what you should be doing. You can do so many different things. And just because you gave a few things away just means that you can explore more of other things. Like me adding a half teaspoon of yeast kind of changes the structure of the yotel significantly. So just adding one ingredient, does that make it a different recipe? <laughs> I would also like to add some West for balance. Um, I'm very excited to slowly remember all of the ideas that I had pitched in the past to Delish that never got made. Something like videos tracking the development of a recipe I think could kind of demystify a lot of what goes on in food media or just what goes on in terms of people who write cookbooks for a living. And I want to do some more short um, videos showing how I've reworked something that maybe didn't turn out right because one of the most uplifting things that I learned in restaurants was how to fix your mistakes. Um, so I think having more recipe videos that are not just like polished versions of here's what you do to make this perfect thing, but rather Here's what to do if you fucked up your thing. Like, that seems more in line with what I want to do. What do you do with an over-salted bread dough? Um, is it baked yet or not? And how overly salted is it? You can either double the recipe or you can just bake it and, you know, don't use salted butter when you eat it. It really depends. So for example, in the H Mart video, I just ended up baking a cake thing on the fly, obviously not using a recipe and just using whatever, like I always do, and it came out a little dry. So then I proceeded to remake the cake that I plan on releasing as a separate five minute video maybe, showing like, hey, what happens if you switch up the ratios a little bit and use a little less flour and a little more egg and I bake it again. It's not a formulated cake recipe the second time around either, but I think it's just an interesting experiment to like contrast what happens when you change all of these variables. Um, it's not going to be scientific like Adam Ragusea's channel. I don't go into like variable by variable so, because I feel like there are people who love that science aspect and they do it so well that like I don't need to force myself to do that. I'm just doing whatever feels natural to me and um, basically showing viewers how my brain works and learning how to be me. Hi Germany! What are everyone's New Year's resolutions, if you have any? Yeah. 
Yes, a new tattoo. But what does a better version of ourselves mean though? You know, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Naz, I don't think you can get ever, ever hotter. Like, there has to be a limit, right? Haven't you already hit past that limit? How are you taking us to outer space with your hotness? Just spontaneous combustion. Just make sure you aim for Elon and just blow up everything there, please. Yeah, be kinder to myself, man. That is an ongoing project. That's not just a New Year's resolution. That's like a now-now thing. Um, I also don't do resolutions, but I've decided that my resolution is to allow myself to be as insane as is comfortable and enjoyable and have fun with it. And the first, um, the first thing that I want to do is to get a septum piercing. So even though so many of you are like, you're not going to look good with it. I just want to do it, man. I don't want to have to die without ever having gotten a septum piercing. I would rather die having gotten a septum piercing and regretted it. How about that? Yeah, I'm definitely going to go get my septum pierced. Um, several people on Instagram reached out with suggestions. I'm looking at them all. It's not the piercing itself that's expensive. It usually fluctuates between $40 and $60 for the process, but it's the jewelry that comes with it. And so I learned with piercing these um, lobe piercings that if I do anything that's not gold on a piercing, it will get infected. So I with a nose especially i definitely need to get gold jewelry to pierce it with and gold jewelry gold jewelry starts at like 260 dollars so this septum piercing will be um it's fine we're just gonna do it we're gonna do it because my next video would make me millions in ad revenue right <laughs> um I also want to, on this stream, eat my final mangosteen fruit. Mangosteen was also part of the H Mart haul. It is very dry now, so I should eat it. Um, I, want, I want the septum to be close, actually. I thought about this a lot. I don't really want it to hang because I think hanging would actually accentuate how short and stubby my nose is. So my main problem with my nose is that there is like almost a non-existent nose bridge. It's so flat that sunglasses won't even hold on. Um, to my to my bridge and they slide in the summer especially due to sweat I've always been very self-conscious about my lack of a <laughs> lack of a nose for better words and I've always been self-conscious about how like upturned and available for for viewing my nostrils are so I think the septum will draw attention to the nostrils in such a way that like I'm displaying them with intention rather than feeling insecure about them, which is why I want a septum and not just a nostril piercing. Although I won't say no to a nostril piercing because I saw this really cool triple piercing basically that um, somebody got a septum piercing here and then they got like matching balanced nostril piercings. And so it's like three rings and I thought that was really fucking cool. But we're gonna start with the septum. Um, probably stop probably should stop filming herself so close to the camera you know the the reason why i started filming myself so close to the camera was because when i first started filming budget eats um i had to use my personal canon dslr because despite the fact that we were all producing content from home none of us were given equipment to shoot ourselves with so that's why the first episode of budget eats and several other hosted videos like the ramen one and uh, everything chicken soup one 
were all shot on my cell phone because we all had to like just make content with what we had on hand and we were all using our own cell phones. And when the first budget eats that was shot on my cell phone started doing well and Julia said, hey, do you want to do another one? I said, sure, but like it looks like crap. Can I use my DSLR? And that's how it started. Um, my Canon DSLR is fitted with a cheap pancake lens that was like $96 when I bought it. And a pancake lens means that you can't zoom in. And I also don't have a remote control for filming the start and stop button. I had to manually press it, which means that to make sure that everything was in focus in every shot or close to it, I had to be relatively within arm's length of the camera in order to click it on and click it off for the record. And also to make sure that it was focused on my face. Given all of those limitations, that's why most of the early budget eats were like this because I truly could not step further from the camera and still make sure that everything was in focus. Once that became a thing and people started being like, yo, your face is too close, that made me just want to continue doing it because I was like, but y'all are still watching, aren't you? So why should I give in? <laughs> um, and uh, that's a, again, that's the kind of company that Hearst is. Um, they didn't allow us to buy phones for our work. Um, they didn't provide anything without us asking for it. Um, even when we asked for it, most times we were denied it. Um, my phone eventually started burning because of how long the footage would go. Like we would film two hours plus on Zoom. It would be burning not only because we were constantly using it to record, um, my memory would run out, like my data would run out. It would be such a slow upload from my phone to the cloud. The transfer of, of files was like a pain. And we only got the file transfer sorted like a year and a half into the pandemic. For a media company, I was shocked that this is how things are run. I've always said that it was, a, it was such a surprise to know that a corporation could run its brands like their startups. This is a, like a heritage brand, right? They're all legacy brands. Um, Hearst has 135 years history now. And so for it to be functioning on this level is so inefficient. Everything is inefficient. And you wonder why workers burn out with this inefficient system in place. And when you speak out against inefficiency, um, HR will make you the problem. So this is a company that is determined to not evolve. This is a company that is determined to shut down voices for improvement. This is a company that is anti-worker. It is anti-union. It is anti-human rights to a certain extent because they won't even give us gender neutral bathrooms. We're about to head into 2023. Gender neutral bathrooms should not be an arguing point for our union contract. Um, it just hurts to know that we give in to systems like this and we allow them to keep running like this. It hurts me to realize that we have not reached um, enough mass and momentum to be like, this is unacceptable on a greater scale. And until we reach that level of mass discontent, society will stay as is. It's not up to anyone. It's not up to me. It is up to all of us, right? Like that's what Bernie said and he's right. It's, it's all of us. Like we have to all be on board to change these things or else they won't. Um, so I'll try to be hopeful and I'll keep plugging away at what I can do, but I also need everyone, <laughs> everyone, now! <laughs> but you also can't rush it, right? You can't rush it. Some people are just not ready for change and you can't make them be ready. You can only do what you can do. So eventually the gluten will develop and it will start to pull away from the bowl. And this is when I get a lid and I let her rest. And tomorrow morning, grandma will have yo tiao.
When handling sticky wet dough, always wet your hands for an easy release. You see how little dough is left? You're welcome. I don't say any of this to like send the hordes out there to attack the brand or even specific individuals, especially not specific individuals because fuck cancel culture, I'm done. Which is why I hate the Daily Mail versions and the Post versions of the story because they have just targeted this, this interpersonal drama to, to, what, to what result? Not, not, nothing. It's not people, it's our culture like that's what's disappointing um so all i can do is say support the workers support everyone who's still at the brand trying to make their paychecks and trying to stay sane and trying to fight for the union contract solidarity with everyone who is trying to make the world a slightly less shitty place. Um, <sighs> I don't want this to be about my managers because they're not the ones at fault here. They're also just trying to maintain their lifestyle, and I, I get it. But it really does suck that we can't get everyone on the same page. But it is too utopian of me to think that I could get everyone on the same page, I suppose. When Steven was interviewing me for the article, he was like, do you think you went too far? And I think he included a line in the article where I said, I think, like, professional decorum-wise, I think I did go too far, but it was because I was so burnt out from having to police myself after seeing two years of anti-union at the bargaining table. And just the lack of transparency was so frustrating because I kept trying to get transparent conversations going and it was met at face you know, value to be a good, acceptable thing to do. But you know, underneath, it wasn't acceptable for me to ask for transparency. Um, and I think it's just like, why though? Why are we afraid of transparency? Why are, afraid, why are we afraid of having these conversations? Like what would having these conversations actually mean? Why can't we have these conversations? That's what I'm angry about. I'm not even angry about people who work at HR who do the, these things for a living constantly because that's the script that they were told to do in order to get paid. But why do we have to work this way? Why do we have to work this way? I also find it hilarious that at the very end of my termination meeting, HR went to say, I'm so, I'm so sorry, something like, I'm so sorry we had to meet under these circumstances, you're really good at your job, and if you ever need anything from us, reach out, you know how to, you have our contact information, and I was just like, so exhausted and shocked, I think I actually laughed, I was like, okay, sure. The incongruous nature of what they do and what they say is mind blowing. It's mind, it's mind blowing. It's like, how could you possibly 
say that and do that together. They make no sense. And at the end of the day, I'm just thankful that I don't have to be in a position where I have to take on a job as an HR rep for a company like this. I can't imagine having to do that for a living. I can't imagine having to be a telemarketer for a living. So I am hashtag blessed to be able to choose to not take on those jobs. I mean, maybe some people really enjoy that job. I don't know, man. Just like some people really like to go into the military and shoot people. I guess we just... We are just all born different. Hi, now go. Life is a joke. Life is a joke and I have to treat it as such. Which is why I don't mind saying I want to go batshit insane because like the world is already batshit insane and if you don't follow suit, it will tear you apart. You have to allow the absurdity of the world to fully be acknowledged and then you have to learn how to appreciate it in order to stay afloat. Um, I think I was, I forget which friend I was talking with, but I was like, for a long time I felt like I was drowning. And he was like, do you think you're not drowning anymore? And I, I said, I think I've grown gills. Now I'm just living underwater. Because if you keep trying to rise up out of the waves that are crashing down on you, you exhaust yourself to no end and you burn out and you break. And you might die like mom did. So you just have to adapt. You have to grow gills. I'm trying to grow gills. Um, I have 13% battery left. as a kid you know I always had health issues so I'm sure some people are just built stronger than I am and able to tolerate more than I can but I've always been like extremely sensitive to my own detriment um, but I'm past the point now in life where all I can do is to focus on my own lackings by comparison to others because that just made me feel like a piece of shit for so much of my life. Now I'm just trying to work with myself with what I have. You know, it's kind of like if you only have $10 to spend at the grocery store, why look over at the truffle aisle where you can afford nothing? You got to you got to look at the beans, you know? You can you can afford the beans and there's actually a lot of beans for you to buy with $10. You could try all the beans. Um, truffle is just out of my ballpark, so I can't, I can't yearn for the truffle anymore. And anyway, I don't even know what truffle tastes like. So who made me yearn for the truffles to begin with? Why do I yearn for something if I don't even know what they are? Why do I yearn for things I can't afford? Who told me I should be yearning for this? The whole concept of success and like, Happiness is so class-based too, you know? All of the qualifications for what success is, all of the qualifications for what meeting happiness is, those are founded on class stratifications. Um, so, yeah, I think in 2020, we were all trying to understand what it meant to unlearn things. 
in like a socio-political racial context, but all of those things are very applicable to a personal context too. How to unlearn hating oneself. How to unlearn blaming oneself. How to unlearn criticizing oneself. How to unlearn warring with oneself. Because I think that is the first step to actually understanding what liberation means. You can't really liberate other people and be their allies until you can fully accept yourself and the ways in which you do not fit in to all these dictations of value. And when you can do that, you can begin to see the world differently. Um, but that takes a while. went to Copenhagen and got me snacks. This was when I had COVID and I was like, please bring me back crunchies. She brought me back this Oriental peanut snack mix. It is so good. And I love how they rate their nutrition score on every single bag of snacks. This one is a D, so we're like very close to failing. But I love failing in life, so I love these too. Um, I also don't like oysters, guys. I don't think you have to like everything. You can appreciate them for the slimy, beauteous, vaguely vulva-looking um, creatures that they are. And the fact that they can produce pearls, I guess, is kind of cool. Bye, Corinne, or Corrine. I, I recently met a Corinne that pronounces her name Corrine, so I don't know how you pronounce yours. Regarding military, yeah, we're not in the military, but any place there's hierarchy is basically military. A lot of restaurant kitchens, core in, core in. Um, thank you. A lot of restaurant kitchens are run like militaries too because they stem from the French kitchen setup, which is very military. The name chef means chief. So he is the commander. Then you have the sous chef, which literally in French means underneath chef. So that, that immediately is a hierarchy, right? You fall under. Um, it's also militarist, militaristic. Um, and it truly didn't help that my direct manager, who I had issues with, had come from a very militaristic kitchen setup from his background. And, you know, he didn't see a problem with functioning that way. And I did. That was a big reason why I left restaurants is because I didn't want to work in that structure anymore. Um, and unfortunately, it was just not compatible for me. So for the better, we have gone off separate. good thank you so much Samira and Samira wants to be in a video and or a live one time so sooner or later you'll meet her
pay clock, just Google um, bypass paywall and the second result that comes up, click into that, copy and paste the business insider link into that text box and you should be able to see it. It's really as easy as Googling paywall remover. Um, the first one doesn't work, the second result works. I think it's removepaywall.com, literally removepaywall.com. <laughs> there you go, Nowco has it, thank you. Um, why does insubordination have to be associated with the military? It doesn't, I think somebody just said it does remind them of that. I guess insubordination is like immediately like a very um, political context of like you have betrayed your country. Um, it seems like a very funny charge that me speaking transparently asking for transparent conversations could count as insubordination. And when my requests for transparent conversations weren't given and I decided that there was no honesty to be had and therefore ended um, my participation in the TV project that that was considered insubordination. How do you make someone feel unsafe and then punish them for their decision to choose to make themselves feel safer. I mean, the funny thing is after I was given the final warning, I did shut up. I got really quiet. I just kept my head down and I did my work. The only thing I did was turn down the TV show because I was told by my contact in the project that it was ultimately my decision to say yes or no to participating in the TV show. Obviously, I hadn't signed anything. This TV show was not a part of my job description in my role as senior food producer at Delish. It was extracurricular. It was simply an opportunity that was presented to me right after I came back from bereavement. I stated at the onset that my mom had just died. I don't know if I would feel like I'm a good fit for TV. I'm a good fit for YouTube because YouTube is a different platform than TV. I made all of my, you know, hesitant qualms known from the very beginning and I was told to keep an open mind. So I did, I proceeded with it. And then the HR disciplinary meeting happened and I was not given transparent conversations with the people that I requested to have them with. And I decided for myself that I did not want any part in this because there was no transparency. And I, I cannot sink further into opacity. Like it just did not feel safe to step into a dark room. Why would I want to do that? And so I decided I wanted to stay safe I'm going to keep myself out of a dark room. I turned down the TV show and a month later I was fired. That's it. That was the sequence of events. Um, they are hiring for a senior food producer. There is a job listing now for senior food, food producer. So my term, my position was not terminated. I was just terminated. Um, Whatever sausage Giannis used in this gray peas concoction is bringing me back to high school lunch. Not in a bad way. In a very good way, actually. No, I don't, I don't, I didn't read into the job description. I'm sure if you Google Delish Senior Food Producer, you can find the job description. 
Um, but I don't care. That has nothing to do with me now. I'm done, baby. I'm out. They don't want me back. And it is mutual. Upper management, there's a secret term, manage them out. Dana, can you explain what that means? What does it mean to manage someone out? Do you feel the truth is not being reported accurately after the articles have come out? Like, listen, nothing is accurate, right? Like, even my interpretation of the events are not so-called accurate. It's not objective. It's just how I interpret them. There is so much unsaid, and due to the lack of transparency in communication, I don't have my questions answered. Um, they will tell me one reason um, for why I got fired. They will tell me one reason for why I got disciplined, but there is so much pretext and subtext and context that is left out. Um, so accurate, it's a part of the picture, but how much of the picture do you need for it to be accurate? I certainly don't think that um, even though it's mostly plagiarized, I don't think the way that the Daily Mail and the New York Post portrayed the story are accurate They've sensationalized it. They've made one of the supporting examples the thesis. The thesis is not the drama that I had with my manager. The thesis is the lack of transparency from top to bottom in the company, leading to um, closeted reasons for why we still don't have a union contract. The big picture is, um, the ways in which they stall change and they snuff out difference and they don't actually allow for diversity even as they like to give themselves gold stars for being one of the best DEI whatever corporations um, that exist. I mean, being a corporation that trumps values of DEI is a paradox, is an oxymoron. Um, so accurate? You decide. Manage out employee means process could include criticizing an employee's work repeatedly and never giving them credit, not supporting them in learning or developing, keeping them out of communication loops, ignoring their requests, or making their life at the company difficult in general. Which is funny because those are basically a reworded version of um, HR's claim that I had offended their uh, anti-bullying code of conduct which is a screenshot that I still have on my Instagram grid the email that HR sent to me after the disciplinary meeting took place they accused me of bullying my manager all those things that they accused me of doing to my manager 
they have done to me. Hilarious. The absurdity. I must develop gills or I will drown. Um, Um, thank you, Vic. Vic says, I hate that this is happening to you, June, and a lot of you have said the same. Um, you are such a light, and I'm incredibly proud of you for standing up for yourself. And, like, Vic, yeah, it's a shitty situation, but, like, I'm not sorry that this happened to me because I have learned so much in this process. I don't hold any grudges anymore because I'm, this is all out in the light now and I'm able to see it um, for what it is and I accept it. I accept that this is our reality. I also accept hoping for change in the future. I want all of us to not have to deal with this hierarchy one day. Hopefully we can all see that we might all be better off in terms of happiness if we got rid of these kinds of hierarchies. I don't mind having managers, but I I mind having managers who can't be honest with me about themselves as human beings. I want to be managed by people who can acknowledge their lived experiences and their flaws because that's what makes them human and that's what makes them lovable and that's what makes them strong too. When you deny your own insecurities, you are denying part of yourself. And when I work with people who deny parts of themselves, I am not working with the whole person. I'm only working with part of the person, and part of that person is warring with themselves. There is so much resistance in that dynamic that will take so much out of me to work with them in an effective way. So I need to, I've discovered and I've learned through this experience that I must find a community where I can work with people who can acknowledge how they feel about themselves truthfully and don't shame themselves for it and also feel secure in their own existence and is confident enough to own up to their flaws that we can work together as human beings, not as... not as actors. Um, it's just too much work to handle so many splintered selves. It's exhausting. I don't want to do it. Um, I just want everyone to be happy, like truly happy, <laughs> and to know what happiness means for them first, to define it for themselves first. Like that would be amazing. So the New York Post and the Daily Mail articles are both heavily plagiarized um, editions of the Business Insider article that Steven Perlberg worked on for weeks with me, directly. Interviewing me, interviewing my coworkers, uh, pulling up documents, fact-checking. The Business Insider article is extremely fact-checked. The Guardian and the post rehashings of that article are just like such cheap versions of the story. And they also highlight it in such a tabloidy, scandalish, scandalish way. Um, it makes me feel gross to look at it. It makes me feel gross to know that this is what they do for a living. So I say, fuck the Daily Mail, fuck the New York Post. They're horrible. They have such large fundings reserved for battling lawsuits because they basically like defame people all the time for their content. Um, there are ways to get past the paywall on Business Insider. I really recommend that you just stick to the Business Insider one because it is um, superiorly crafted as a news piece and um, the only one that I really authorized in a way that I participated willingly. Um, I think it has, out of the three, the most balanced 
viewpoint, um, and it is the most holistic one, and it highlights way more than the other two the parallels between what I went through personally and what the union has been going through against Hearst as a company. Um, I am just a microcosm. I am nothing in the grand scheme of the union. Um, the only way we can affect change is through the union coming together in solidarity to take collective action to push for that union contract. Once we sign that fucking contract, we can actually start to hold the company accountable um, for change, for its workforce, its entire 500 people heavy unit. Um, I'm one out of 500. I'm not even 1%. I'm like 0.2%, you know? So it's like negligible, but I am a story that reflects the wider dynamics of what's happening to the union. Um, the union is repeatedly getting shut down for its requests for improvement in the workplace, and we are being gaslit over and over again about how we're just too needy, we're too bitchy and whiny, and we don't deserve any of these things, and how dare we ask for these improvements. It is the same dynamic that echoes from the personal to the greater union-wide push for change, not only within Hearst, but across the entire industry of media and beyond media, all industries deserve to have higher standards of living. If we are living in 2023, and we continue to have these more efficient ways of production, why is it that we are so still continuously burning out as workers? Why are we still working so many hours without a pay increase to match? I just, it makes no sense. Right? We're working just as hard. Inflation is going bonkers. We're not getting paid the same ratio of like expenditure money. We're getting paid with one or two percent raises, but food is eight to ten percent higher. Like something doesn't make sense here. I don't know where this money is going. Um not to the people doing most of the work. <sighs> Well, Karen, I think I've already flown away. <laughs> I chose not to wait in that mess when I turned down the TV show, right? Um, and I think that's what made them scared of me, maybe, because they saw that I wasn't scared to walk away. Yeah, I'm still very friendly with my coworkers. Um, I hang out with some of them. I get food with some of them. I chat with some of them. I send memes with some of them. I, I'm trying to keep in touch because they're all amazing people. They've all been so kind to me. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the team. Like it was, I would not have stayed at this job for so long if I didn't have such amazing coworkers. Um, so many of them carry the spirit of solidarity. We all believe in the union. We all want to see change happen across the industry. We all want better for ourselves. Some of them are more scared than others because they're newer to the industry, which is understandable. You can't rush readiness for someone else but i hope by speaking out and i hope by showing what i went through that it makes people less scared to develop their own voices because as i said in a union meeting 
Um, I'm just one voice. I can keep talking, but at the end of the day, I'm just one voice. We need more voices to come forward and we need them to build up to a chorus because there is only strength in numbers. We can only affect change through solidarity and collective action. Um, in a lot of ways, I did what I shouldn't have done, which is to, you know, forge and stand my own ground alone. But it also got to the point where I was like, I don't understand how I can continue to survive in this nonsensical environment for much longer, especially because my mom had died. Like, I can't stress how important mom's death has been on me as a factor in me identifying what I needed to do for myself. To not only stay sane, but also to support myself in my own development as a person, to understand where I should be drawing my boundaries, to understand what I need to do in order to honor myself. Um, because in honoring myself, I feel like I am honoring mom. Mom would never stand for me being bullied. She would probably have encouraged me to just reduce contact with problematic dynamics because she wanted to see me in a stable job. And she probably wouldn't have been very um, secure in sitting with the decisions that I've made. But I made the decisions that were necessary for me. And I don't regret any of them. Because at the end of the day, it is all a part of my learning. It is all a part of my growing. It is all a part of my evolving which has no end goal or end point. It's just constant. Um, hi, Louisiana. Sorry, did I say The Guardian? The Guardian didn't. It was the, gosh, I keep mixing them up. It was the Daily Mail and the Post. I don't think The Guardian ran a story. But The, the Guardian did publish a story with um, an interview with me about uh, a month ago, I think. That interview was done in August before I had been terminated. So, a lot has happened in the past half year. A lot has happened. I mean, Karen says they're gaslighting employees to think they should be grateful to have a job. One of the first anti-union meetings that was held with our entire brand, with all the brands at Hearst, um, Troy Young, who was the president of Hearst Magazines at the time, who has since voluntarily left the company due to allegations, um, said to us that Hearst has a history of taking care of people and their families and that it is a privilege and honor to work at Hearst and that it is a choice to stay working at Hearst and if we don't like it, we can leave. which is a sentiment that was expressed to me by my direct manager uh, two or three months before I was fired. So when I say it's a top-down culture, it's a top-down culture. It's not just about one or two managers. It's not just about one or two people. It is the entire script that this machine is running on. And of course, if I'm trying to jam the script up, the machine will chew me up and spit me out. And I'm thankful that I got spat out. Because I sure wasn't going to be much better staying in that machine. Oh, 
I was really happy on yesterday's live. I loved being back in that old kitchen that has so many nice memories for me and traumatic memories too. But it was also delightful because it was Christmas and Aaron was cooking and I got to eat Raisy's hummus and I got to see Fred and it was all in all a great time. Like everyone's like sometimes people are get, get so upset to know that like Aaron and I are no longer together as a couple, but we're still great friends. Like we still take care of each other and step in when the other one needs something and He's helping me build my computer that I will one day edit my videos on. It's great. I love my life. <laughs> There's been a lot of change. It's unconventional, but I really do love my life for now. I am really happy. Um, it's not a kind of normal happiness, but that's what makes it all the more special that I can relish living this abnormal <laughs> routine and still find contentment in it. It's it's a pretty bright light to see. Yeah, and I was I was I did move like right before I got fired. So it was really strange timing. I was like, oh cool. So I don't have a job anymore to pay for this new place. Got it. Cool. Um, but I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. And like a bunch of y'all just donated uh, cash monies to me to get me my Birkenstock boots. So that's been ordered. I'm excited to wear them and show you guys what it fits like. Let's, let's hope it fits great. So thank you for your Christmas present. Um, and I'll be fine. Truly. I will be fine. I may be rash, but I am not yet that um, rash to put myself on a limb and not have a security net for myself. Mom is still in here. Even as much as I rebel against her all the time, she is still in here. She is solidly implanted in here forever until I die. So can't, I can't leave that responsible mom behind. Um, <sighs> isn't it funny how we prize all these things like a TV show, huh? I wouldn't say no to a TV show. I would welcome a TV show. But I don't want it to be a dumb TV show that doesn't work as a concept that they're just putting out because they want to see if it can make money. I don't want to be somebody else's investment that they reap the benefits of. I don't want to be someone else's gamble. If I make a TV show and I participate in the production of it, I want to make sure that we are putting out content that fucking means something, that is driven by values that would feed us. Um, not shitting on the reality TV out there that I love so dearly to consume, but I don't want to be one. Like, I love eating potato chips. I will keep eating potato chips. But I would rather be like this weird Bailey's flax green raisin oatmeal cake than a bag of chips. Does that make sense? Maybe? And then we can cut up that oatmeal once it solidifies and coat it in crushed nuts and fry it, and then we can drizzle some chocolate on top, you know? That sounds fucking delicious and weird and disgusting, but also intriguing. I wanna find that show. <laughs> I'm still reading comments from 237, which is like eight minutes ago. 
Bye, Napco. Enjoy your pizza. You're probably gone by now. So, okay. KCS says, the fact that Delish gave a month of bereavement was impressive and depressing at the same time. No job I've ever had has allotted for that. I found out during contract negotiations after I came back from bereavement that Hearst's standard bere bereavement policy is the national standard of three days only. My month-long bereavement was a special case that apparently was granted to me because my coworkers advocated for me together and offered up their PTO to support me getting a full month of bereavement off. Isn't that fucking amazing? I don't know if they actually ended up having to donate their PTO or if just that move of collective action pushed the allowance of me getting a full month of bereavement was enough. Like, that is what I mean by solidarity. And that is why I love my coworkers. Like, they did that. And it is possible for them to do that, apparently? I don't know. That's just what I've been told. I've never been able to, like, suss out the immediate details, but I found out during contract negotiations that Hearst's policy is still three days. We were arguing for 12 in our in our contract um so i was my bereavement was an exception and i don't know exactly what happened to have that exception granted to me but um pretty amazing if what i've been told is true what we can accomplish when we collectively fight for something And if I didn't get that month long bereavement, I would have quit on the spot because there was no way for me to handle all of mom's shit um, with the PTO that I had left, which was like three weeks. Freddie's brain freeze moment was so adorable. I had never seen him have brain freeze before. <laughs> uh, yes, yesterday's live stream was great. Um, and I asked, um, and I asked Aaron later that night, "Do you like living alone?" And he was like, "Yes." And I was like, "See, we're just living our best lives now." I'm also glad that I stayed with Delish for as long as I did because once we hit the pandemic, my role changed so drastically that it turned into a very different um, arena. And I was able to develop all these skills of learning how to shoot my own video. And I learned that I had a visual angle to shooting video on my own um, that was not possible before in a studio setting. So I'm grateful for the opportunity. And no regrets, right? Je ne regrette rien. All this free group therapy I've just received and I still haven't come up with my New Year's resolutions. Y'all are hilarious. Um, yes, my Venmo is thank nine stars. You don't need to send me money, but if you want to send me money, <laughs> feel free. Um, I'm okay for now. I'm okay for now. And um, I'll let you know when I'm starving. <laughs> I'll start begging. There was a comment on a few lives ago that was just like, just another YouTuber begging for money. And I was like, I guess, but like, not really. I'm not, I'm not at that stage yet. I will beg for money eventually one day if I need it. But my policy is I'm here to survive, um, not to thrive. B 
because I feel like the way that we've framed thriving is so capitalistic in nature. Like my, my thriving is just surviving. I'm okay with surviving and I'm doing great in, in terms of surviving right now. I'm still buying my dollar bags of produce. They're still great. I love eating them. Um, just gonna keep being me. June, you said that the video from Cabin was the last video from Delish. What about the other videos from you on Delish after that since you don't work for them anymore? What other videos? I'm not on contract. All of my relationships with her are separate though. Some people have been, um, I don't even know why or how or if they're just like, smitten with me but some people have been comparing me with Nigella like damn that's a comparison Del says, if you're reading this, how do I use tofu in place of meat and dumplings without it being too wet and soft? You gotta not use soft tofu. You have to use extra firm tofu and you have to press the shit out of that. You should probably stir fry it beforehand or you should actually just buy this. TVP, textured vegetable protein. You don't have to buy the Bob's, but they are worker owned. So I support Bob's when I can. They are kind of more expensive, but TVP is great. You just rehydrated it and it just tastes like ground meat. Obviously you have to season it with fat and spices, but way better than trying to crumble up tofu that might be too mushy. PTO is pay time off. Oh, you answered that. Right, right, right. Um, I have PayPal too, um, but that would entail my phone number and email, right? Which I'm not comfortable giving out over YouTube right now. But thank you for your thoughts. I truly appreciate it. When the time comes for me to beg for money, I will, guys. I will have no shame when I need to survive. Um, You guys have so many comments, I'm still behind, holy shit. Um, I was actually talking with my friend Samira the other day regarding this YouTuber begging for money stereotype. Um, she was telling me how like insane it is, how different my Instagram is. And I was like, why? And she was just like, I don't know. It's just like, you don't have a persona. And I was like, I do have a persona, like I'm June, right? But she was like, you're not like selling a persona. And I was like, yeah, that's true. When you see me sell shit on Instagram, know that June is over. Doesn't mean that I won't support brands. Like I will still tell you products that I like to use, but if you see me selling shit on Instagram, a part of me has died. Um, just letting you know now. <laughs> I don't wanna get to that point. I'm gonna see if I can try to stay independent for as long as I can without having to hawk out for sponsorships, but the day might come. We'll see. I don't know. It might be too like innocently stupid of me to think that I could coast on without it, uh, sponsorships, but we'll see. We'll see. Oh, those budget videos from New York that Delish posted. So I had asked, my, when I got fired,
inspired, there were three videos that were not yet published that we had already shot. They are the Flushing Food Tour, the Astoria Food Tour, and the Budget Eats where Aaron did the shopping. And because we had taken out the crew for those food tours and we had promised the business owners in those videos that we would feature them on this channel, I was like, we have, we have to put them out if you can. And so having also shot like six days of footage for that budget eats, I was like, the people deserve closure. I deserve closure. Like we worked hard to get that work done. I would, it would suck if they would never see the light of day. So I was actually the one pushing Julia to try to convince the higher ups that we should publish them because they were afraid that I was gonna be like, what are you doing? I got fired, why are you still putting out my content? I actually wanted them to put out the content because I wanted the audience to have it. I wanted the team to see their work manifest. I wanted to selfishly see my work out and consumed. I wanted to see the business owners supported with exposure and I wanted closure because I think the last Budget Eats in My Kitchen was shot and edited in such a way that it felt like a natural ending and I, I wanted that to exist. So that's it. Those are the last videos. I will never be making videos for Delish ever again. Have you thought about setting up a newsletter? Yeah, I have, but Instagram is kind of my newsletter right now. I don't, I'm not collected enough to send out newsletters, you know? Um, what would I write about? Has anyone famous contacted you with support? Uh, I'm not sure about famous, but this, um, this lawyer from, I think the organization is called Standing with Asian Americans reached out and offered support if I wanted to ever litigate based on grounds of di discrimination. And um, something in me did not feel like that was an appropriate move for me. One, I don't, I've seen Hearst at work with their lawyers. I don't want to give away any more of my soul and brain to drama. Secondly, this isn't about identity politics. Yes, I'm Asian. Yes, I'm female. Could those factors have factored into how I was treated? Quite possibly. No evidence to say yay or nay. It's just there, right? That's why white supremacy culture is such a thing. I know it's like scandalizing almost to call it that, but like historically speaking, the history of how these traits formed in the structures that we have now were race-based, were, were European-based. Now everybody does them. I contain white supremacy culture traits too in my actions. I'm trying to unlearn them. It's not easy. I've lived my entire life holding onto them as values. But I don't think this should be an identity politics thing. This is very much um, a case of a worker demanding something, the company not willing to provide her with it, and then punishing her for demanding change. It is more in line with retaliation for union activity than it is identity politics discrimination. And I'm not saying there is no discrimination. I'm just saying I want the focus of the story to be on how much this company fears unionizing and what that would mean for their future. That is a fight worth fighting because that is a fight that can get all of us on board in solidarity in total collective action because it goes beyond just the individual identity of being Asian, being female, being whatever. It is material means and context and situation that affects all of us. Um, 
So that's how I'm viewing it. And that's how I want to push the narrative forward because I want to see this industry change. It's not just about me and how I was treated. It's about how everyone at that company is being treated. It's how everyone in this industry is being treated. You saw what happened with Bon Appetit. Yeah, people left Bon Appetit. They got canceled. They hired BIPOC talent and editor in chiefs and whatnot. And now what? They're still fucking unionizing. Like two and a half years have passed. Not much has changed. They are still fighting for material changes as workers. So in this particular way, identity politics very much actually destabilizes the collective action nature that we need to instill and build and solidify in order to actually move together as one. And I'm not saying we ignore our identities. I'm not one of those people who are like, I don't see color. I fucking see color. I wanna cherish all the colors that we have. I wanna, I wanna use all of the colors to fucking paint a gorgeous palette. The most beautiful scene you've ever seen. We gotta use all of these colors. But I want us to work together to build this painting, you know? I don't want there to just be one color <laughs> because that is actually isolating and defeating and it, in a weird way it hones in on the smaller bits and details rather than zooming out and showing you the whole picture and I think we need to see more of the big picture in order to move beyond the frame. If we keep zoning in to particular identities we will never move out of the frame and right now this frame is trapping us all and I I, I want to get the fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> I don't want to be in this fucking frame anymore. I need us to bleed. Bleed beyond it. Um, yes, Alicia Kennedy. Um, I've been reading her for two years now, since the beginning of the pandemic. She has impacted my thoughts so much. I owe a lot to her in terms of how I view food and the corporations behind what drives these businesses, the practices, the inhumanity of it all, the, the cruelty, and um, I totally appreciate her writing, and I continue to be a subscriber, and um, I highly recommend everyone who's interested in food, uh, vegetarianism, uh, anti-capitalistic, anti-corporation stances to subscribe to her newsletter, Alicia Kennedy. Pretty great. Um, Have a good time walking with your kids. Instant Pot's ready. I can finally end this live and stop ranting. <laughs> wow. Wow. Smells like farts. the lawyer meant anything bad by like offering their services but I just felt like it wasn't the route I wanted to take you know yes dumpling dough should be shaggy and craggly but wet your hands and keep kneading until it's smooth okay it's fine to have a few cracks but not if it crumbles you want it to stay together 
I guess this turned out to be soup. Whoops. And yeah, Del, you should be kneading for five to 10 minutes. Take breaks in between or just let it rest and come back to it after an hour and keep kneading again. It should not have huge cracks in it. It's fine if it has one or two, but it should be holding together cohesively as a dough. So kale, crushed tomatoes, um, these peas, and caramelized onions, and spices, and I think that might be it. Bye, Karen. It might just be that you need to add a little more water, but I don't recommend you pour in the water. I recommend you wet your hands and then knead it with wet hands. That introduces just the right amount without sogging it too down. Because depending on the flour that you use, the temperatures of that day, the humidity in the air, you might need different amounts of water. It's, that's the thing with working with dough. It's about feel, not about measurement. That's why Chinese people don't use recipes, okay? <laughs> so you don't have to knead it all in one go. You can bring the dough together. If it has cracks, work in a little bit more water with your wet hands. And then once you only have one or two large fissures and you're tired as fuck, just cover it with plastic wrap or a towel and come back to it in half an hour. And do it again with damp hands. And it should be fine. Just be patient with it. You didn't mess anything up. It, it doesn't matter. You just need to give it time sometimes. KJ, I will do grocery hauls. In fact, my next big video for myself will be an H Mart haul, but I don't think I will do deals based anymore. I'm kind of tired of like price based things. I know it gets the clicks on YouTube, because everybody's obsessed with price, but like your mileage may vary, right? It's not really practical. You go to any Budget Eats episode, you'll see in the comments, people saying like, they can't nearly buy this much or they can live on $25 for a whole month in like some Southeast Asian country where the currency exchange rate is like different. So it's just, it's like, I will shop what I shop and it's going to be hyper local and it's not gonna be applicable nationwide, but I'll still cook shit with it and take you places. And I'll just make whatever I make and you decide if you wanna watch it. And then I'll decide if I wanna keep making it. But thank you for the idea. We have a lot of ideas. Do, do you have any existential book recommendations? My favorite philosopher concept is the Abject by Julia Kristeva, but that is like philosophy read. It is not um, a novel read. The last book that I read that I really enjoyed is a novel. It's called The Floating Opera. It's very postmodern. Um, I identified with the main character a lot, but it is very postmodern in that cheeky, detached, um, piecemeal way where it's not really like a linear storyline so if you enjoy that kind of jokey atmosphere and un unreliable narrator um the floating opera might be cool i don't want to really go into a stranger's house honestly and to shoot that myself would be really hard because i would have to shoot like interactions with complete strangers i've never met before but if i had a crew that would be and I, that was an idea that we were going to do next for Budget Eats. I would actually have gone to co-workers' kitchens and cooked with whatever they had on hand. But alas, it was not meant to be. This channel has been monetized for a year now, baby. 
I just don't make enough um, off of ads to go full time yet, but the content has been monetized. But you can definitely get an ad blocker to block the ads. I don't care. Do whatever you feel like doing. I don't choose the ads though. YouTube chooses the ads. I just choose whether or not to monetize the video. They put the ads where they want to put them. I think I can go back and after the fact and change where the ads are placed. But, ooh, this is delicious, y'all. The tomato has kind of melted into the kale's woodsy flavor, but then the anchovy broth with the mushroom umami is giving it this almost, oh, I guess I put cinnamon sticks in it. Yeah, it has a, like a very star anise um, sweetness curve to it. Like, licorice almost, but not quite. I guess the fennel helps too. Yes, this is a new tattoo. His name is Batty. This is very soothing and comforting on a very cold day in my drafty apartment. I highly recommend tomato kale pea soup <laughs> if you like all of these things. I can say tasty all I want now. You're so right. Oh my gosh, my world has changed. Well, I've always been able to say tasty on my own channel, but it was in fact a banned word at Delish. Aaron gifted me this one too. I went through a very serious spork phase and he got me these two sporks um this one has like more of a knifey and a can opener or a beer bottle opener edge to it there were so many banned words that we weren't allowed to use that was also another thing that like i put up with i accepted it but i never liked it like we couldn't say anything to do with the mouth, like mouthfeel. Mouthfeel was a banned word. Oh man. Oh boy. I am happier. Can you not see it? <laughs> I feel like I can see that I'm happier now. Gooey was banned. Ooey gooey was banned. Moist. Moist was banned. Moist was banned. Moist. <laughs> How many of you are triggered right now? Sometimes there just isn't a word. In English, that's better than moist. Like, what do you want me to say? This cake is wet? This cake is soft and buttery, I guess? I don't know. Cake was damp. <laughs> this damp cake. I have made many a damp cake. <gasps> no joke. All right, y'all. It's been fun. I'm gonna go um, watch my Netflix now because I fucking canceled that shit and my last day with Netflix will be January 6th. It's been nine years since I've had Netflix and I calculated it, even at my grandfathered in price point of $10.99, 
I have given Netflix a thousand dollars over the last nine years. Over a thousand dollars has been paid to Netflix and I probably watched it for less than like one or two hundred hours. So I'm gonna carpe diem the fuck out of my last 10 days of Netflix and then we say goodbye to it because I don't even have internet right now, so. <laughs> It has been so fun ranting with you all. Thank you so much for joining me on this lovely Monday. Mm. And, um, oh, Borneo. Borneo? Borneo? I'm not familiar enough with that country to even know what it's, what it's pronounced like. Um, but yeah. Thank you all for being my parasocial friends and for all of your support and for all of your free money that made boots possible for me.